Welcome back to Logic 101. I'm William Spaniel, and today's topic is tautologies. So where are we and where are we going? Well, before we've been assuming that things are true, aka premises, and then we've been using those premises to show that a conclusion of interest is true as a result. So given that these premises are true, then this conclusion follows. What we're going to be doing today is very different from that. It's very weird, and yet as a result of that, it's super cool. We're going to be looking at tautologies, that is, statements that are always true with no premises necessary. So you can have premises, you can have no premises, it doesn't matter. These statements, these tautologies, are always going to be true, period. Now, the way that we prove these tautologies is very strange. So that's what we're going to be looking at for the most part in this lecture today. Let's look at an example. Suppose that we want to show that the tautology P implies Q or Q implies P is always true. Well, we need to get to work on that. And as you can see, this is going to be quite burdensome. There are tons and tons of lines that we're going to have to go through in order to be able to show that this is true. And part of what's driving that is the fact that we have no premises to play around with, right? You don't see line one, which is a premise, line two, which is a premise, maybe line three and four are also premises, and then conclude what you see on your screen there. It's just straight up conclude that. Right? And so this is going to be asking yourself a tricky question, which is how do you go about doing this without any sort of premise to work with? Well, actually, there's a reason that we're doing this lecture now as opposed to, say, two lectures ago. And that is we have recently found the tools that we need to be able to prove tautologies. We have two different proof methods that don't rely on premises, right? Most of the proof methods that we've looked at so far require premises to fiddle around with, but the two most recent proof strategies that we've looked at don't rely on those things. Proof by contradiction and conditional proofs, neither one of those things relies on having premises to play around with. So whenever you get a tautology, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be starting out by looking at a proof by contradiction or a conditional proof question is, which one do you want to work with? Well, for today, we have a statement which is a disjunction, right? There's that or there. And so it's actually pretty clear which one we want to play around with. We want to play around with a conditional proof. And the reason that we want to play around with a conditional proof here is that we know by material implication that conditional statements are essentially or statements in disguise. So if we start off a conditional proof and we show that a conditional proof holds, or and we essentially get the result that we're looking at from the conditional proof, we can then use material implication to morph that back into a disjunction. So essentially what I'm doing here in my head is working backward, right? So we know that the last line of this proof, as always, is supposed to be the conclusion. And then through a little bit of logical magic, we can work that conclusion, that statement that we already have at the top, back into an implication. So if we were to have the statement not P implies Q implies Q implies P, then we could apply material implication to that. We would be negating the antecedent and turning the main operator there, the conditional statement in the middle, into an or. And that would give us the middle line. And then through double negation, we would finish off the proof and get what we were looking at from the start. So in other words, this is the reason that we want to use a conditional proof because if we can get to that third to last line, we have essentially proven what we want to prove. Now again, working backward gives us a big advantage here in that we know what we need to be finding with our conditional proof, and we know what we need to assume for the conditional proof to start with. So let me actually do a little bit of racing here, right? We wanna just focus on this right now. Our conditional proof, the goal of our conditional proof is to show that this is true, because if we can show that this is true, then we can use the two other lines that we already saw to reach the conclusion that we're looking for, the tautology that we're trying to prove. Well, the reason that this is useful, and again, working backward, is that we know that the last line of the conditional proof is supposed to be the consequent of the conditional statement. So we know that the last line of the conditional proof should be Q implies P. 
And we also know one other thing that is going to be quite handy. We know what we should be starting off this conditional proof with. We should be starting it off with the antecedent of the conditional statement that we're trying to prove, which is, again, that third to last line right there. Not P implies Q implies Q implies P. So what we're going to be doing, starting up at the top now, with line one, we're going to assume not P implies Q as our assumption for a conditional proof. And I'm going to keep those other two lines at the bottom to remind us where we're going with this. We're trying to, again, ultimately show that if we assume not P implies Q, then we can, through a conditional proof, get Q implies P to fall out of it. All right, so now let's go through this and play around with some things and see if we can get to Q implies P. We didn't have any premises before, but this is the magic of proof by contradiction or a conditional proof. Conditional proof, what we're doing today, of course. The magic of this is that we've created essentially a premise, a premise that we can fool around with. Whereas we didn't have anything to work with before, now we have something. So what are we going to do with this? Well, another killer proof tip that I gave you before is that we should De Morgan's everything that we can. And while we can't apply De Morgan's to conditional statements, we can apply them to disjunctions. And we know how to get conditional statements to turn into disjunctions. We can do that through material implication. So let's apply material implication to line one. What we're going to be doing there is inside of those premises, we're going to negate the antecedent and then turn the conditional into an or statement. And this is purely for the purposes of now applying De Morgan's to this. So what do we do with De Morgan's? Well, we distribute that negation on the outside and we put that into everything in the center or inside of the, uh, inside of the parentheses and we turn the disjunction into an and statement. So distributing, we get the not, not P and then flipping the disjunction, we get the and and then distributing the negation once more, we have not Q. And this is through De Morgan's. De Morgan's everything. De Morgan's is your best friend. Well, the next line should be pretty clear what we want to do. We want to have those double negations go away. So through line three and double negation, we get down to P and not Q. Well, this is actually very useful because now we have statements that are simple statements, right? We have a P statement, and then there's this not Q as another statement. And we know that both of these things are true. So the question now becomes, which one do we want to focus on? Do we want to focus on just P? Do we want to focus on not Q? Do we want to focus maybe on both of them in conjunction? Well, we actually have a reasonable answer if we work backward. Look at that last line of the conditional proof. The last line of the conditional proof is Q implies P. And if you remember back to the very beginning of this course, we know that a conditional statement is true if the consequent is true. So the consequent here is P, and we know that the statement Q implies P is true if the uh, consequent P is true. But from line four, we know that that's true, right? So we know from line four that we, if we simplify it, right? We just have P sitting there by itself now. And through a little bit of logical work, we should be able to figure out how to turn P into Q implies P. So now this is just thinking about how to morph things around. And in order to get a conditional statement to appear, well, we one of the things that we could do is make a disjunction appear. So we always have the ability to uh, randomly introduce new things to statements if we know that one of those statements is true. So we know that P is true, which means we can, of course, introduce the fact that not Q or P is true. And the reason I'm choosing to do not Q here is because, again, I've done a little bit of thinking ahead and working backward, because our next line is going to be to switch those things around through commutativity, which gives us not Q or P. And then lastly, we finally have finished our conditional proof. Through material implication, not Q or P becomes Q implies P. And then the rest of the work is done already from ahead of time. So by wrapping up this conditional proof, we can take the first line of the conditional proof and the last line of the conditional proof and merge them together through a conditional. And that's exactly what line nine looks like. So actually, this is a typo right there. That should be uh, lines one through eight conditional proof give us that statement on line nine. 
And then applying material implication to line 9, we have a negation of the antecedent, and we turn the implication into an or statement. And then finally, we are now done. If we apply double negation to the antecedent, we get P implies Q, or Q implies P. And that is our tautology. We have successfully shown, using no premises at all, that P implies Q, or Q implies P is true. And that means that this thing is true regardless of premises. You don't need any premises. This is just a statement that is true, period. Tautologies, they're really cool. And again, when you're working through these on your own, you're going to be looking at negations, rather I should say proofs by contradiction or conditional proofs to get going on these projects to eventually show that these tautologies are true using the premises that you effectively create by assuming things for the proof by contradiction or the conditional proof. So I hope you enjoyed this and I hope to see you next time. Take care.